Welcome back to ACT program webinars for healthcare professionals. I'm Robin Geiger, Senior VP, Clinician Advocacy for Ingenivus Health. Today, we're hosting a panel discussion on advancing inclusion, and I have the honor of introducing our panelists. Starting with our own Ms. Joy Turner. Ms. Turner is the current Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager for Ingenivus Health. She holds certifications in DEI in the workplace, inclusive and ethical leadership, cross-cultural leadership, and is a certified diversity professional. She has an impressive track record of transforming organizations into inclusive and empowering spaces. Thank you for bringing this panel together, Ms. Turner. Thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate it. Next, we have Ms. Ashley Glass, the founder and CEO of Black Women Cultivating Change, where she works to reduce the stigma related to mental health in the Black community. She is also a maternal mental health manager for Best Point Behavioral Health, focused on mental health of mothers and some of our most vulnerable populations in Cincinnati. She obtained her bachelor's degree in health education from the University of Cincinnati and her master's degree in public health from Kent State University. With a recent bachelor's degree in nursing from Mount St. St. Joseph University, Ms. Glass, welcome. Thank you so much. It is also my pleasure to introduce our next panelist, Dr. Patrick Decker Tonneson. He is an equity, inclusion, and diversity advisor at Mayo Clinic. Um, he holds a doctorate in social work from Loyola University, Chicago. And his area of focus is on the experiences of individuals who have historically marginalized identities. Dr. Decker Tonneson also holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Mount St. Mary's University and a Master of Social Work, as well as certificates in nonprofit management and phil philanthropy and measurement and quantitative methods from Loyola University, Chicago. Additionally, he holds a diversity, equity, and inclusion certificate from the University of South Florida. Welcome, Dr. Dr. Decker Tonneson. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. I told you I'd trip that one. All right. So we want to start by asking some questions on different topics um, just to get the conversation rolling on advancing inclusivity. Again, thanks, Ms. Turner, for bringing together this panel. I would love responses from each of you on this first question. Starting with Ms. Turner, what does inclusion mean to you? Thanks for that question. I think it's a great way to kick off this conversation. Um, to me, inclusion means really focusing on creating environments where individuals of all backgrounds um, really feel like they're valued, respected, and empowered to contribute based off of their perspectives and experiences. So it goes beyond like representation and that diversity number and really focuses on creating an environment and fostering that sense of belonging for everybody. Wonderful. And Ms. Glass, please share your thoughts on the meaning of inclusion. I agree with Ms. Turner. Um, and then for me, inclusion is just um, really uh, taking a deep dive into what your experiences have been, your biases, that sort of thing, and being able to know how not to uh, project that onto the population that you serve or know when maybe you're not the best fit and maybe someone else might be best better in that situation. So making sure in whatever spaces that you come into um, that you're um, being able to welcome everyone in and treat everyone with dignity and respect. I understand. And Dr. Decker Tonneson, how do you define inclusion? Yes, I I completely agree with my co-panelists, Ms. Turner and Ms. Glass. And I think the only thing I would add on is that I think inclusion can look different for everyone. So I think, and it's, I think it's really important for me to identify as a white man that the way that I feel included will look different, for example, from Ms. Turner and Ms. Glass. Um, and that's really critical, I think, in healthcare for us to be cognizant of that because um, at the end of the day, we really wanna meet people where they are, uh, uplift them how they are and make sure that their sense of inclusion and belonging is respected by, based on their individual identities and needs. Okay. And since we, we ended this last question with you, and thank you so much for that response, could you start us on our next question? Um, what does it mean to build inclusive spaces in clinical settings or at the bedside? 
Absolutely. I think one of the most important components of this is making sure, again, that each patient that comes into your healthcare facility or um, your clinic or your practice is seen from the moment they walked in. And what that looks like in a clinical setting is um, ensuring that person feels represented, not only in the staff that they're interacting with, but that the overall environment is safe and con uh, con conducive to them. So for example, um, I identify as a member of the LGBTQ community. And when I walk into a healthcare setting and I see a, um, a little pride memento or a little flag, a pride flag, I instantly feel at ease and know that the people that I'll be interacting with most likely will understand how to use pronouns or most likely will how to know how to utilize uh, preferred names and understand differences in gender identity. So those are just a couple examples from my end. Hey, Ms. Turner, can you share your thoughts on this question? What does it mean to, to build those inclusive spaces in the clinical settings for you? Absolutely. I think Dr. Decker Tonneson provided some really key insight around creating those spaces where people feel safe, but to take it a step further, especially in clinical settings, I think it's important to provide learning opportunities for those that are supporting the patients so that they actually understand what that means and what that looks like. So pronouns is a great example, making sure that the clinicians, the support staff, whoever it may be, understand the why behind why, you know, we're using pronouns or doing these things in order to support our communities and providing them, you know, these types of webinars, learning resources to continue those conversations. Um, and pronouns is one example, but it goes beyond, you know, that we can look at overall cultural competencies just so that we are making sure that we're giving them the tools to actually build these environments. So I think learning is key there. Okay. And, and building on that question, Ms. Glass, just with a little bit of spin on this, I mean, how do you approach those inclusive spaces for members who are not, not uh, accustomed to, to recognizing all of those demographics or utilizing pronouns, if maybe they're opposed to utilizing pronouns? How, how would you approach um, making that more inclusive for them and sharing or educating them on, on why it's important? I think the biggest thing is just to make sure everyone knows that none of us are perfect and we all have um, different biases and um, it's okay to be uncomfortable if they are uncomfortable, but let's at least address it and know that um, when you chose to work in this profession, you chose to work with various diverse uh, populations. And so that means you might have to, you know, um, come in contact with people that you wouldn't normally um, come in contact with. So just um, making, letting them know that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay if you are uncomfortable again, maybe you're not the right person to interact with this patient or family, maybe someone else should, but just knowing yourself and um, being able to navigate those feelings and emotions. And then also just being more open-minded. Um, no one has all the answers. No one, you know, is always right. We are all different. Um, even though I identify as a Black woman, uh, Black women are not a monolith. So there's all different types of Black women. Um, and so we can't put everybody into a box or a cage or anything of that nature. There's, it's just very diverse and just to be open to learning new things and meeting new people. So. No, I like that response. It, it's okay to not feel comfortable is huge. What I, what I took from what you just said. It's okay to, to open that conversation up. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit later about psychological safety. Um, but going back to Ms. Turner, you've been quite immersed in the clinical setting over the last few months. Um, so why is it important to diversify the clinician population to be more reflective of the patients that we serve? I think it's important to diversify the population to build that layer of trust. We have these conversations on the corporate side all of the time about representation and how we start to see representation for any organization, right? Start to fizzle out the higher we get to the top. And so in a clinical setting, I think that having that representation available at every level helps people feel more comfortable, feel more confident in the diagnoses that they're receiving. We've had lots of conversations around how race can play a part in the way that people are treated 
from a medical perspective. So making sure that we do have those advocates at every level that can help support and really build and bring those communities together, I think is incredibly important. No, I agree. And I, I can tell you as a provider, um, the statistics de definitely weighs a little bit different depending on diverse backgrounds and population health and prevention, health prevention. So that's really important to, to specify that. Um, Dr. Decker Tonneson, from your organization, I mean, you're, you're part of a very large organization, you know, how are you diversifying that clinician population um, just to make sure that it's more aligned with what you would see represented in your patient demographic? So that's such a good question, and I, I I definitely resonate with what Ms. Turner shared. I think for, for us at Mayo Clinic, something that we're very keen to be tracking closely is the, the trends that we're seeing at a national level when it comes to diversity within healthcare. So for example, we know from the AAMC that uh, today U.S. physicians, uh, medical school students, medical school leadership, hospital leadership are still overwhelmingly white. Uh, when we parse out those statistics a little further, we know that hospital leadership in general is almost 88% um, held by white or uh, white individuals. So there's clear disparities when it comes to representation, especially at those uh, higher levels that Ms. Turner was identifying. So we're really kind of looking at the ways to address how is that relevant to us in our, our Mayo Clinic health system? And um, something that we're looking at doing across the board at our organization is examining what our communities look like, where our different hospitals and healthcare systems are. Uh, so, for example, if we if we have a hospital in Phoenix and we know that Phoenix, Arizona, is roughly 60% uh, non-white uh, individuals, and ideally, we'd like our workforce in Phoenix to be representative of that community because then it's more likely when a, a patient from that community comes into the hospital they'll be more likely to see someone that looks like them. And the last uh, note I'll add just very quickly is that um, many, and I know uh, Dr. Geiger, you're probably very familiar with this as well, but the, the data is there that shows that um, patients of color are much more likely to have better health outcomes if they're seen by a physician of color. So it really is paramount to health equity. Right. No, I, I agree. And I've spoken, I've spoken um, at different conferences about health equity and the importance of being able to, to self-identify or relate. So, I mean, as providers, sometimes in areas, and I just want to add this, um, there are sometimes rural areas where you may not have the opportunity to have a very diverse provider network. Um, and so, within that network of providers, it's important to relate be able to identify, to understand different cultures um, and customs so that patients feel more comfortable. I totally agree. Thank you for that, that response. Um, Ms. Glass, you just entered the world of nursing. So what are, what are your thoughts on diversifying the clinician population to align with patient demographics that we serve? Well, I have many thoughts. So <laughs> since I'm a recent grad, <laughs> um, First and foremost, I had, before I entered into the profession, I had no idea how um, how not diverse nursing was. I didn't think about it like just being a patient, interacting with a hospital without actually being on the clinical side um, until I enrolled in school. And I'm like, all right, I'm, you know, the, you know one, of, one or two are the only one in the classes. Um, and so I pulled up some statistics and it's kind of dated, but in 2020, um, it said that 40% of the U.S. population identify as people of color, but by 2045, um, they are projected to be, be the majority. Um, but when you look at nursing, only 19.4% 19, 19 um, are considered minority. Um, and of that 19.4%, um, only 6.7% African-American, 7.2% Asian. And when you think about the patient population that goes into the hospital systems, um, a lot of times, um, it does not reflect those clinicians. And then even within the hospital systems, as Dr. Uh, Patrick had mentioned, 
um, there's like a hierarchy. So you have more of the people of color, they're working EVS, they're working, maybe they will be PCAs, but then like you said, in the leadership positions and even nurse managers, different things like that, it's majority um, white. So um, my whole thing is we need to look at how do we not only recruit and retain more uh, uh, people of color into this profession, but look at even just kind of the makeup of our educational system, is it equitable? I know going through my classes, we only had um, one class on population health and we spent a very small amount of time on health disparities. And when we think about health disparities and how much it impacts our healthcare system, um, it should not be that way. That should be like a uh, mandatory, I don't know, it, should, it shouldn't just be a smidgen in one class. Um, and so how do we incorporate that into our educational system? So even if our clinicians don't reflect the patient population, at least they're equipped to deal with different diverse backgrounds and cultures and different things like that. Um, I've had people in my classes that have never interacted with anyone outside of their race. Um, and to me, um, being a person of color, that's just mind boggling, but that's just the, the nature of the beast. Um, and so very passionate about this and um, just think it's a multi-tier issue, of course. But yes, I, I think it starts from even just at the beginning, even the, the educational system, so. No, thank you for that. And it takes us a little bit into some overlap with that basis of education. And so I'd love to add that question and ask, you know, um, from your educational background, how much diversity, equity, inclusion training did you see in, the, in those spaces? Um, Dr. Decker Thomason, maybe let's go back to you with that. And you know, what would you suggest for for starting that really sol solid foundation? Yeah, that that's a really good question. I think so. I'm a social worker by training, and when I originally enrolled in um, my master's of social work program, the the field and it continues to be very white. That that's just the reality that the social work field, especially within healthcare, has been navigating for a long time. I, I do have to say, though, amidst how that demographic was so prevalent within the, my education experience, when we look at nonprofits and healthcare systems in particular, especially those which are in uh, metropolitan areas, you see uh, high, high concentrations of non-white or minority uh, patients or clients. And so for a lot of social workers, I think we were we were kind of put into these uh, these work environments where we are um, we don't have the training per se, but all of a sudden we are uh, forced to reckon with ourselves that we need to advance our education and our skills and our knowledge because we're administering services and um, uh, client services and healthcare to patients who are um, who don't necessarily match our identities. So. I think looking at this in the healthcare system today, it's really important to, to make sure that education at all levels of an institution is fully ingrained into the core values of an organization when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think it's really easy for us to say that, you know, we can mandate one unconscious bias training and think that we've done our jobs and pat ourselves on the back, but the reality is, is that, and we all, I know all of my co-panelists and the moderator know this, but the learning journey for DEI is lifelong. And I think if we're not making sure that people are learning the entire time they're interacting with diverse patient populations, it's going to be a disservice to those patients. We understand, Ms. Turner, if you have anything to add to that foundational learning for DEI and educational institutions. Absolutely. I echo everything that Dr. Decker Tonneson expressed as far as making sure that it's really a part of that holistic journey for our clinicians and the populations that they support. And I think that as we really continue to evaluate what's working, where our opportunities are in these healthcare settings, we really do have an opportunity to incorporate this to Dr. Um, Decker Tonneson's point beyond an unconscious bias training. One of the things that we're focusing on here internally right now is rolling out eye disability, which Dr. Geiger, I know you know you're really helping us with that, but giving our clinicians the tools that they need to interact with demographics that they may not be comfortable with 
with or they may not be used to working hand in hand with. Um, because if we're not providing that education and that training to them, how are they going to navigate that at the bedside? They can't. Um, they, at least they can't do it in a way that um, leads to productive outcomes for the patient. So I think that just really continuing to integrate those learning opportunities at every level, even once you hit that executive level, there are still opportunities there. And we just have to be a lot more intentional about making sure that people are taking an active role in that learning journey. Probably great, um, great point, Ms. Turner, um, of just making sure that we keep them, that we're giving them the tools that they need to succeed because we're definitely sending them out there um, without all the tools that they need if we're not making sure that they have that foundational aspect of DEI. Thank you, but thank you so much for answering that. Um, Ms. Glass, if we can go back to you just for a moment here. As healthcare professionals, we often deal with sensitive cultural and social issues. How can we ensure that DEI efforts not only promote inclusion, but also foster respectful communication and understanding? I think in my experience, um, it is about including uh, the patients and communities in our processes or decisions that we're making within the healthcare system. So um, if we're working with different communities or different types of people of different backgrounds, uh, we may need to make sure that their voice is heard. Um, we can't always just assume that we know what's best for a certain population or even a certain patient because everyone's different. Um, and just with my professional experience, that has been the best thing is um, developing like, um, I think they're called, I'm blanking, but uh, groups within the hospital in which you invite patients and families of different cultures and backgrounds to actually come in and be a part of the decision making, pro decision -making process, come in and be a part of the policies, come in and be a part of the uh, patient experience improvement, different things like that. Um, because without their feedback, um, you're going to miss the mark. Um, I, I think that is like the biggest learning lesson I, I have had is making sure we include um, who we are serving and taking care of in every step of the way. I agree. Dr. Decker Tonneson, do you have anything to add to that? And I, I know what you're, you're speaking of, Ms. Glass, of that um, multicultural interdisciplinary group, which we also, you know, at Ingenivis, we have an interdisciplinary, um, we have an, a chief nurse advisory board, but I love that it's interdisciplinary because we do have physicians and we invite social workers and just from different backgrounds so that we're making sure that we're really making those inclusive global decisions in the correct way. And um, so, I definitely support that. I think that it's important to involve different aspects and different people from different backgrounds in the community. Um, again, Dr. Decker Thomas, do you have anything to add? Sure, and I, I, I also echo Ms. Turner's points, um, or excuse me, um, oh, I'm so sorry. Ms. Glass. Ms. Glass's points. I, the, the one thing that I was thinking about uh, when you posed this question originally was how important it is for leadership to be involved in this process. So. I, a lot of times I think to myself, when we look at the healthcare system and what are some of our, our major challenges around DEI today? And I think all of us on this call probably are familiar with how polarizing and political uh, DEI topics have come become in the workplace and how that constantly is a threat to any progress that we're trying to make related to health equity or other forms of um, inclusion and belonging efforts. So I think what I would add to that is that when we think about the, the importance of um, thoughtful communications and really bringing in community voices, I think it's, it starts at the leadership level uh, for leaderships just to, to understand that this is an issue that um, they really, we really need to be mindful of the ways that we um, interact and respond to our social environment. Um, in really intentional and thoughtful and constructive ways, because I don't think as a society we're going to move away from this uh, really polarized environment anytime soon. So the, the, the need for us to be even more responsive to these types of um, uh, issues that, as they arise is really important. Ms. Turner, do you have anything to add to that? I agree that 
leadership should be very involved. They should actually be at the front lines of these types of conversations. And I think that to Ms. Glass's point, these systems historically are developed by the majority. And so as we're looking at ways that our systems support those not a part of the majority, we're seeing a lot of opportunities and a lot of gaps. So creating those safe spaces to welcome those other perspectives in is key. But I think there also needs to be an understanding of what diversity means. Um, to Dr. Decker Tonneson's point, it is a very polarizing conversation right now when we start to have dialogue related to DEI. So if people understand that diversity goes beyond race, gender, you know, if you're a part of the LGBTQ plus community and understand that there are so many dimensions of diversity that do still capture those a part of the majority, I think that will help continue to move this forward because then they'll recognize like, okay, although I may be a part of a majority in this particular demographic, I am still very much an individual. And that's what we're trying to get to, understanding the individualized needs of people and creating systems that support that. Um, and you, you mentioned something, Ms. Turner, just a minute ago that, you know, there's a question already that it kind of surfaced about, you know, the difference between inclusivity and affirmative action. And there's some confusion between where those two meet. So, you know, if we could go back to that at our Q&A, um, I just wanted to keep that in, your, in the forefront yeah. here for all of us so that we can be prepared to answer that question that's coming. Um, but back to Dr. Decker Tonneson. Um, so you've been in the profession of social work and healthcare for quite some time. Um, so addressing unconscious biases um, is crucial in advancing inclusion. Um, what practical steps can healthcare professionals like me, like uh, nurses, clinicians, respiratory therapists, what, what professional, what steps can they take to identify and address maybe their own inherent biases? Yeah, I, I would circle back to what Ms. Glass said a little earlier about the importance of understanding that no one is perfect and that we are all prone to mistakes. I, as you said, I've been a, a DEI practitioner now for about six or seven years. And every single day I wake up, I need to remind myself that I'm a human being who is filled with unconscious bias. And the way that I look at people or interact with people will always uh, be directed by some of the biases that I have held since I was an infant. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is because I think at a fundamental level, what we can all do practically every day is just acknowledge our human or our human nature. Uh, remember that we're on a learning journey. Um, in practice, you know, I I just as an example, my my spouse identifies as gender diverse and they use they them pronouns. And I need to practice all the time, just making sure that when I'm gendering my spouse, I'm using the correct pronouns. And that's just an example of my personal life. But um, when you apply that to the, the clinical setting, it's it's the same thing. It's, you know, when um, if you identify as a white person and you're interacting with a patient of color, it's not making assumptions about that person. It's not, it's not um, or it's also actively tearing down the stereotypes that you might hold. And the same goes of, or the same is true of all identities, you know, not thinking that someone with a disability is a less equipped or um, again, some of these like these negative stereotypes that have been very prevalent in our lives. Thank you for that answer. And I, and I knew that you would, you would have that nice, honest, psychological aspect to add to that. So I really appreciate that um, that feedback. Uh, Ms. Glass, what steps would you recommend to healthcare professionals on identifying their own inherent biases and, and like how to overcome them? I know at going through nursing school and I mean, you've, you've been through a couple of different programs and healthcare. I mean, what did you do and what tips or tools can you recommend to them? Um, tips and tools. I agree with what Dr. Decker Thomason said, okay. but also just uh, immersing yourself in uh, spaces that you don't typically immerse in. So um, make it a point to uh, visit a uh, multicultural fair or um, watch a documentary. There's tons of stuff on Netflix or different things like that to kind of just immerse yourself in different cultures. There's tons of stuff out there. Um, you don't have to, we're not saying you have to like one day you're this way, the next day you're 
you're this health equity expert, but just it's a journey and you're, you're never going to be an expert. I tell people all the time, I am not a health equity expert. I am, um, I say a catalyst. So just, I like to get people thinking like about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so just um, not getting out of your comfort zone, I guess, in a roundabout way, that's all I'm trying to say is get outside of your comfort zone because you're going to interact with so many types of people um, that you, I, I don't know, I still interact with different things and see different things and learn different things. And um, even when something, I guess, typically would make me feel nervous or just uncomfortable, now I kind of gravitate towards it more and just want to know more like, okay. Um, and I will give an example. Um, and it is like, they're called furries now. And my kids were kind of explaining to me, like, there's this whole furry culture. And then um, I had met someone and he kind of explained why people do this. It's more of a um, kind of like a mental health well-being thing and just learning more about it. I was like, oh, okay, I totally understand that. So whatever it is that, you know, might make you feel uncomfortable or you're like, okay, that's different. Just learn more about it. That's, that's my um, suggestion. And I need to learn more about these furries. So I may be coming to you after this. Um, Ms. Turner, I mean, what are your recommendations um, on addressing inherent biases just from your historical perspective in this space? I would say the first thing is active listening, listening to truly understand the people that surround you versus listening to respond. I think just as humans, we have a habit of listening and wanting to say something versus listening to just kind of sit with it for a while and truly understand that person's perspective or their unique experience. Um, so active listening and trying to start to develop that layer of understanding is crucial. I think um, both Dr. Decker Tonneson and Ms. Glass mentioned it, but it's also a part of that learning journey and unlearning things that we've seen as we've grown up, you know, in society or in the media and kind of like that sensational since the sensationalization of the things that we hear on a day-to-day -day basis and understanding what we know to be true versus what other people are telling us um, and I do think that there are a lot of really useful tools and resources out there. One of my favorite things to send to folks is the Harvard implicit association tests. Um, free resource accessible online. And while it's not going to say this is your bias 100%, but it gives you an idea of where your biases could lie. And then it allows you to start to dig in a little bit deeper and understand, okay, maybe I have been looking at this all wrong the entire time and I need to shift my perspective or learn a little bit more. But just kind of having that baseline of okay, maybe I do have a little bit of bias toward this particular group or this particular thing. And now that I'm aware of that, I can start to move forward in a way that helps me unlearn some of those behaviors. Oh, very nice. Um, just to hear all of this, it, just from the, the, the recent questions that we've been talking about or just the topics, we, during this conversation, we're building this bridge to advancing inclusivity, and I love that. So active listening and, you know, looking at unconscious bias, and it's okay to have those unconscious biases and how to address those. So I like where this is going. And then our next, you know, Ms. Turner, let's stay with you just for a minute um, to start our next topic um, on establishing psychological safety. So, you know, we all need to feel welcome and safe to express our concerns or point of views. What advice do you have for healthcare providers um, to building or, or to build a welcoming and safe environment for staff and patients of diverse backgrounds? I would say, again, it starts at the leadership level. I think that leadership really has to walk the walk, not just talk the talk when it comes to creating these environments of psychological safety. So if we want to really encourage open communication and get the community involved in our decision-making processes, leadership has to be the ones owning those processes, making sure that the staff at the front lines feel comfortable saying, hey, I don't think this is right. So can we maybe put a think tank together or get right. some additional thoughts around 
why we're doing things this way. And also being comfortable with people asking questions. I feel a lot of times when processes are already established, folks just go with the status quo, even if they recognize that something may not really sit well with them or the patients that they're taking care of. Um, so making sure that leaders are saying, hey, it's okay to ask me questions. Let me know what you think or proactively reaching out for that feedback and saying, you know, I wanna understand how you feel about this process. What are your patients saying about this? So that we can really start to meet in the middle and come up with ways to best move forward. Um, so making, again, making sure that leaders are comfortable and willing to own those open communication lines right. so that folks do start to feel safe and comfortable expressing their perspectives around whatever um, is going on in that moment. Thank you for that. Dr. Becker Tonneson, you have a solid background in psychology. And I know this only adds to your ability to support clinicians in this DEI space. So what are your recommendations on Oh, for building a warm and safe environment for all backgrounds. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that um, I, I think about right away with this question is the importance of reviewing institutional policies and practices because if, so at an organization like where I'm at at Mayo Clinic, we have thousands of policies and practices, but it really is the onus of clinicians and staff to be advocates to say, we need to review these to make sure they include inclusive language. Uh, we, we know in the US that the vast majority of our institutions, especially ones that are uh, 50 plus years old, were most likely founded by white men. And a lot of the inaugural policies and practices that went into the foundations of these organizations are rooted in patriarchy and hierarchy. And in a lot of ways, that is instantly um, works to the disadvantage of marginalized groups. So within organizations, just taking that step of looking at policies and practices that you lean on really heavily, even more than we probably think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but making sure the language is inclusive and it includes um, a full compass of diversity when you're talking about marginalized groups and making sure that there's not bias in your recruiting or your hiring practices or your promotion practices really goes a long way. Well, that's really important. And if I can stay with you just for a minute. Um, like we, so we talk about leading up or needing to lead up in some instances, let's say for example, they're new leaders or leaders that are new to DEI, you know, how can we support their leadership team? Speaking back on what Ms. Turner said about it, it needing to start with leadership. So we do have leaders that are open, um, but may, may not be very familiar with DEI or how to impactfully utilize DEI. So how would we lead up with that with, in those situations or support our leadership teams? What examples would you have or suggestions would you have for that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I also, I think about the nature of the systems that we all operate in. So for a lot of us uh, who are maybe mid-career, for example, we have, we have folks above us in organizations who are incredibly skilled, incredibly talented, incredibly educated, but they, they might need some level of, um, of guidance, especially when it comes to DEI topics, because the reality is, is a lot of uh, folks who are, especially folks who are older in the workforce, they didn't really have the education when they first began. So, um, while there is some, what I would describe as minority tax, so the need for marginalized groups to educate others involved in this process, I also think it is important and something that um, is really critical for people who have also uh, majority identities to lean into. Because, for example, if me as a, a cisgender white male goes to another cisgender white male who is overseeing me, and I have a conversation with them about DEI, they might be more receptive to it because they share identities with me. And that's, I think that's important for us to recognize that, you know, those power dynamics are there and they exist, but it really is on the onus of all of us to be able to have the confidence and the, um, also the, the support and the trust of a workplace to be willing to have those difficult conversations. Mrs. Glass. 
Post-pandemic, we're seeing a decline in DEI focus in healthcare. And there's been some articles lately about, you know, is DEI declining? You know, where is DEI? So what can we do to turn that around? I think one of the biggest opportunities we have right now is to recruit more diverse um, populations into the healthcare field. Um, there's a lot of people leaving the healthcare field, especially after COVID. Um, and I always, my question is, okay, if we made the process more equitable and we're able to recruit more of a diverse staff, couldn't that solve the problem? So I think if we could truly look at um, just the system of healthcare, um, starting with education, how we're recruiting physicians, clinicians, all of that, and make it a more equitable process, make these ad admission tests and certification tests equitable too as well. Um, I think uh, that would then um, bring back a more stronger push for DEI with just having a more diverse workforce. Um, but that's kind of my theory on it. <laughs> so. Sure. Ms. Turner, you have anything to add to that? Yes, so I agree with Ms. Glass. I think that making sure that we have those targeted, very intentional, diverse recruiting efforts is really important. Um, but that always takes me to the question of what then, right? So if we do all of this work to bring them in, will they stay? So I think that there has to be a lot of work done at the very foundational systems level before we invest so many resources into bringing diverse talent in so that we can also retain them. Um, and I think that can look a little different depending on where you sit, but ultimately it does come back to education, making sure that people understand the why, making sure that people understand um, the end goal, right? So what are we trying to accomplish here? Providing those tools and resources in order to make sure that whatever plan we have in place is going to be successful, but also building in accountability mechanisms so that the leaders and the people that are responsible for continuing to advocate for these changes are doing so in a way that's actually meaningful um, to those around them. So I think having that foundation of education, making sure that we're holding folks accountable to whatever goals we've established, and then moving forward in a way that can retain top talent um, is really crucial to that conversation as well. Thank you. And that's really important. And then we often hear about the challenges of, of, of advancing inclusion. Um, Different organizations have different challenges. Can you share one key takeaway? And I'm, I'm asking each of you um, that someone could start incorporating into their daily lives that would support advancing inclusion in clinical and medical spaces. And you know, maybe let's start with you, Dr. Decker, Decker Tonneson, um, and then Ms. Ash, Ms. Glass. Sure, I think the, the one thing I, I would propose is to to if you're not already, and I'm sure many of you are, but think about uh, mentoring and sponsoring your colleagues, uh, especially your colleagues who have marginalized identities. And if you are someone with a marginalized identity, um, consider asking someone who you look up to to be your advocate or your sponsor. And I think you know that that can be very difficult and scary, but I think the rewards that come with that, especially when we're looking at increasing representation in the work workplace are really critical. Thank you. Ms. Glass? So I'm a huge advocate for mental health. So I feel like if we put more focus too on self-care and just knowing yourself, knowing your limitations, knowing your um, emotions, that sort of thing, and digging deep and kind of um, trying to understand and learn about different cultures, different backgrounds, all of that, I think um, that will truly create more inclusiveness. So it starts with self. We can't go out and try to educate others and create all of these things if we're not dealing with our internal um, struggles and issues that we have going on. So, so that is my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ms. Turner. I think really piggybacking off of what Ms. Glass just shared, that layer of self-awareness is incredibly important in these conversations. So I would say being open to unlearning, and we talked about that a little bit already, but, you know, 
we've heard things from our family or our bosses or mentors that we really looked up to that as we continue to really evolve in this field, we're recognizing, okay, maybe that's not the best way to go, or maybe that's not the way to think about things. And so just being open to unlearning what you've grown accustomed to over the last several years, I think will really help folks continue to move the needle forward. Thank you. And now we are going to entertain any questions. That's, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I, I, I have a feeling that this is just the tip of the iceberg here as we enter some of the questions. Um, but starting with going back to the affirmative action, the question about, you know, the difference between affirmative action versus inclusivity. And this question is open to, to either of you who would want to start first with taking this. I'm happy to kick it off. I would Thank say you, no problem. At a very base level, affirmative action is a policy. It is something that was designed in order to combat some of those systems that we've seen that have been historically designed to support the majority. So affirm affirmative action is very much just that, a program to help incorporate more diversity, whereas inclusion, that's an act. That is a thing that anyone can do in order to make someone feel like they belong in a space, in order to make someone feel more safe, more comfortable. Um, inclusion should not be looked at as a policy or as a program. It should very much be an intention set of actions that are designed to help someone feel like they belong. That's my perspective. All right. Very nice perspective on that. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Glass, do you have anything to add? I agree with Ms. Turner. Um, and just as she put it, very simple. One is a policy. One is that whole self-awareness, knowing what actions you're you know, exemplifying when you're interacting with people and making sure that the environment is safe and they feel comfortable. So I have nothing more to add. I think she did a very good job explaining it. Wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Decker Tonneson, anything? Yes, not, not too much to add either. I, the only thing I would say is that and going back to um, in a comment made earlier about the importance of recognizing that affirmative action really is kind of a um, and I know this is obviously a very um, a very hotly contested topic right now with what just came to be in the Supreme Court, but affirmative action was really a tool to increase diversity and representation within the workforce. But inclusion, um, as was stated earlier, is really the, the making people feel seen and heard and safe where they work. And I think um, you, it, it doesn't really matter what diversity you have in the workforce if you don't have a safe and inclusive work environment. So I really think those two things need to happen together. Thank you. No, I, I, I totally agree and, and understand. That, yeah, there's quite a bit of debate uh, right now about affirmative action. So thank you for entertaining that question. Um, and then another question that came up in, in our, our work to uh, facilitate this, this discussion was how to address pronouns for those who maybe they don't want to use the pronouns or they don't want to actually you know, actively use the pronouns but they don't want to exclude anyone or make anyone uncomfortable. And either of you can take this question. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. So I think um, a number of years ago, I was giving um, presentations and workshops on LGBTQ healthcare in rural settings. And the topics, the topic of pronouns was often the most contentious among the training groups. And a lot of the reason why it was because people said they had religious objections to using pronouns. And the what I what I always come back to in this conversation is, and I think this is really fundamental to most uh, major religions in the, the, the across the globe today is this baseline idea of respect. And just because someone uses a pronoun that you might not feel comfortable or familiar using, I think we can all relate to the concept of respect and how important it is for us as humans and as religious beings, because many folks are, to, to not necessarily 
put someone in a box and fully define them based on the fact that they might use they, them pronouns, but instead be more mindful of the reality that that's a multifaceted person. They, all might, they also might be a person of faith. And um, yeah, just thinking about how, how respect really plays into the equation, I think is really important. So I totally agree. It's, it's definitely all about being respectful um, of how someone else wants to be recognized. Um, in my mind, in my thoughts anyway, Miss Glass, do you have anything to add to that? I know we're coming to a close, yes. but um, if you have anything to add to that or a last uh, takeaway that you would like to share with our audience and our listeners. Um, not much to add, just treat others how you would like to be treated. So yes, maybe this might go against your religious beliefs, but Again, when you signed up to work in this profession, you didn't just say you were only going to work specifically with people who only had, you know, certain pronouns. So you have to take yourself out of that, you know, personal conflict and think about the greater good. Um, and even with religion, we're supposed to treat others with respect and love. And um, so if you want to, you know, bring religion into it, you still it's not said to um, be negative or nasty to anyone. You treat everyone with respect and dignity, no matter what. Um, and if they prefer certain pronouns, even if you forget, ask a question. Don't be afraid to ask a question or apologize if you make a mistake and say the wrong pronouns. It's it's all just simple acts of kindness and respect. Yeah. And Ms. Turner, ending with you, um, do you have any last thoughts that you would like to share? Um, with our audience, our listeners today. Yeah, I think that Dr. Decker Tonneson and Ms. Glass shared some really key points around pronouns. And so the only thing I'd add is that um, it costs nothing to respect a person in their identity. So making sure that that's top of mind and to Ms. Glass's point, we're all human. We might make a mistake, we might mess up, but you can only say you messed up so many times, right? Like at some point we do have to be active participants as a part of this journey and make sure that we are making that really cognizant effort of treating people with respect, respecting who they are, um, and not contributing to the micro inequities people are probably already experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. Mispronouncing someone's name constantly or constantly using the wrong pronouns when they're in your email signature. Um, those are types of things that subtly can minimize someone's identity. So making sure that we are actually trying to respect that. Um, if you don't wanna share your pronouns, that's okay. If you feel like your gender identity is one that people just understand, that's totally fine. But we should definitely respect what other people um, want to be referred to. And that causes no harm and costs you nothing. I love it. Thank you for a nice wrap up, a nice way to end this uh, panel discussion today. I certainly thank you, each of you, for being here today and, and, you know, guiding us through advancing inclusivity. And we hope that you will join us again next time and that certainly all of our listeners and audience will um, join us next month um, as we um, take on a new adventure on our ACT webinar for healthcare professionals. Um, until next time, thank you so much. Really appreciate that.